My name's Sam Newman. I'm the track host for the microservices track today. You're in the big room for the small services. Uh, there's lots of great talks coming up throughout today. Uh, I'm not going to give the next speaker too much introduction because I am the next speaker, and that will just cut into my time, which would be selfish. Um, before we go any further, you should have been told by now there is an awesome app. You can go and download the app. You can rate the talks. Speakers really love like more notes about feedback, so rather than just the votes, if you could leave a few comments, that would be great. That's also where you ask questions. So during the talk, if you ask questions, I will ask myself questions at the end of the day based on the questions that you send me. Um, so anyway, I I'm here to talk about application security and microservices. And we should probably start off, I'd like to get a sense of the room, find out who is in here, uh, get, a, get a level, a baseline level of where we're at, get a, fair, a shared understanding of who we are. So to start off with, hey, how many people here are doctors? Any doctors? Different doctors? This sort of doctor? Any of these doctors in the room? Anyone? Can't quite see from the lights. No. So I know. Are there any um, virologists in the room? Oh, the house lights came up. That was lovely. Are there, is, are there any sort of virologists in the room? Any doctors in the room? Uh, no, because uh, no one that knows about bacteria. Any bacterial researchers? No. Okay. Uh, how many of you know the importance of washing your hands? Thank you. Yes, this is good. Right. I just needed to check out some basic stuff. So. We are not all of us collectively. We're not deep, you know. We haven't spent years researching how bacteria travel around and how viruses are spread. We haven't spent years doing medical research and cutting up cadavers. But all of us know the importance of washing our own hands around controlling the spread of nasty germs and diseases. The reason I start off talking about this is because this is a talk about application security in the context of microservices. And I have a feeling that we are with application security where we used to be with testing, um, say, 15 years ago. We used to have this idea as developers that somebody else did the testing, because testing, oh, yeah, very specialist, very, yeah, real uh, specialist skill. Uh, oh, yeah, they're really valued people. Oh, I, I don't do that kind of thing. No, no, I have somebody else do that for me. And over time, we realized, yes, there was value in having specialists, but there's some base level of testing that we should be doing for our own application. And yet, when it comes to security, we sort of abdicate responsibility. We say, oh, no, 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 there are specialists for that kind of work. You have to pay a lot of money and get someone in to do some penetration testing, which sounds very exciting. Um, I say it sounds, I, I, you know, but, but we have got the equivalent in the security sphere of washing our own hands. There is some base level of understanding about what application security is that each and every one of us should have. Um, some of you may have been at Jez's talk yesterday. He says, if you've got a, you know, one of, the, one of the statements he made is, if you have a, a system out there on the web, it's, easily, it's either already been hacked or is about to be hacked, or your system has no value. If you are out there, somebody is going to try and do something to your system. And so many of the practices that we as developers have don't set us up well to survive that inevitability. So I'm starting with a little bit of a G up. You can do something to fix it. There is an equivalent of washing your hands out there for security. But I also need to scare you. Some of you may have seen this map before. Hands up if you've seen this before. Right? If any of you want to say, you know, make it plausible that you're doing deep research into security attacks at work, just go to this website and have it running on a spare monitor while you actually you know, play Minecraft or something. Your boss will come over, will be transfixed by this map, and here's what this map will show. It's a live updating attack graph of what's happening around the world. These are various different exploits being launched from different places and attacking different locations. Uh, it's always quite interesting at the moment, Australia is asleep. Uh, nothing's really happening over there in a the moment, and in a minute, there we go. Uh, I was screen capping this on my laptop. My laptop got very uh, slow while this attack was kicking off. So it's very interesting. You see where they're coming from, who the targets are, the different vectors. These are pretty indiscriminate attacks. These are people running, you know, using their, uh, their low energy ion cannons and all these sorts of things, skipped kiddies, botnets, that sort of work. Fairly low-level basic stuff, but this is the background of what's happening out there on the internet. Hopefully, you're not under one of those points up there, but maybe you are. 
This is a talk about microservices, mostly so I could get you in the room to talk to you about security. So we should talk about what microservices are, of course, and this is what microservices are to me, which is small autonomous services uh, that work together, modeled around a business domain. Uh, you may have your own definition. You can write that in your own book. I have a book. There's lots of them outside. Please buy some. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a kid I've got to send to university. Um, this is an interesting uh, a context to operate security in. We have this idea that we are breaking up a, what used to be a more monolithically deployed system into smaller units that can be deployed independently. And this is both a blessing and a curse when it comes to security. It starts off as a blessing in a way because we start to avoid the all your eggs in one basket problem. We don't have all of our code sitting there in one place, all of our code, all of our processes, all of our data in one location. You drop the basket, you've broken all the eggs. You crack that one process boundary, that one database, you've got access to all the data, all the process. What we allow instead is we can actually look at these things independently. We get to target security protections independently to these different units. We can look and reason about the security profile, the attack vectors of an individual part of our system, and apply the right protections for that unit, not having to worry about protecting everything. We, we avoid the problem of having the lowest common denominator. We can do things like find different perimeter models. Rather than having one perimeter because you have one deployable unit, we now can have multiple different perimeters for our services. You might be doing things with you know, um, software-defined networks and you know, programmable VLANs. You might have multiple layers of different intrusion detection systems. You could be running these things on different cloud providers, mixing services that run on-premise and off-premises. We have a huge array of new opportunities available to you to protect your application from malicious users, from malicious attacks. And this is the good side. This is the opportunity that microservices give us. Unfortunately, the great god of microservices gives and takes away with equal measure. Because not only do we have these multiple new opportunities of how to protect our applications from malicious use, we also have a larger attack surface area. What used to be in-process calls are now going over network boundaries. These are networks that could be observed, that could be sniffed, that could be intercepted, that could be malformed. We have multiple machines that we've got to make sure that we patch. Any one of these now potentially becomes an attack vector. And if we design our system without any protection in terms of how services talk to each other, if I crack into one process, I may well be able to exploit your entire network of connected services. The other problem with security is that we often lack a sensible framework to reason about it. And we actually put too much of our effort into stopping bad things from happening. And I'm here to tell you that the bad thing will happen, and so you've also got to give some thought to how you handle that situation. I was, until very recently, a consultant at ThoughtWorks. I spent 12 many happy years there. I'm now in a startup. But even so, I know how to do a good quadrant every now and then. And I'm going to share with you a really useful model that we use at ThoughtWorks in thinking about security. We're going to use that to look into what can we do in the context of microservices around application security to come up with a bit of a balanced approach to dealing with application security. And we start off where most people start and stop their journey into security. We're going to talk about prevention. This is stopping the bad thing from happening. But if something bad does happen, if our prevention mechanisms don't protect us, we also need to talk about detection. Do I even know a bad thing happened? Once I know that a bad thing has happened, I then need to know how to respond. And once I've responded, I need to know how to recover. And you need to be putting effort in all of these places. Maybe not the same amount of effort, but you need to be able to be thinking about a balanced approach to application security. And this is something that everybody can be part of. Let's start talking about prevention. So many years ago, I was working at an organization that had just started to take a bit more of a serious approach towards information security. And they set up an InfoSec team, and the InfoSec team started to look at things like premises security. Um, this organization had multiple offices around the world, and they were thinking, okay, we've got very different approaches to how people gain access to our premises. And they started suggesting, you know, what we need to do is actually have cameras on uh, on the front doors of our property to deter people from coming into our premises. And then if something does happen, we've got a chance of finding out who the actor was and maybe understanding what the impact might be. 
Now, this organization was sort of a fairly, uh, you know, had a, had a fairly um, lively internal debate about the sort of morals of putting uh, sort of uh, CCTV on the front doors of, of these premises. And they say it's about invasion of privacy, it's because you don't trust us, blah, blah, blah. And this went on for, you know, a few weeks. And then someone rather meekly stuck their hand up and said, uh, before we put CCTV cameras up on our front office in, I think it was Melbourne, uh, before we put a front uh, camera up on our front door, should we, should we fix the lock on the front door first, maybe? Turned out for many years, the front door lock had not closed properly. The door would often be left open while people went over, over, home overnight, and anyone could just walk in and just push the door open. And this is often the problem with prevention. We see a potential problem, and we spend a lot of effort fixing that potential problem without realizing there are much easier exploits that someone else could, could use elsewhere that might be much easier and cheaper to fix. We don't really have a rational way sometimes of approaching these preventative mechanisms. Aside from the privacy implications of the CCTV camera, it would have been much cheaper to spend maybe $100 getting a locksmith in to fix the door lock. There are a bunch of different techniques out there for giving you a rational model to think about your prevention and where you should spend effort. And most of the time when we're talking about prevention, what we're talking about is raising the cost of an attack so high that a malicious party would not want to use it because the benefit to them is much lower than the amount of effort that they're going to incur, right? That's normally what you're talking about. Um, Bruce Schneier, uh, many years ago in a, in a a paper, it was an article for Dr. Dobbs, um, back when Dr. Dobbs was still a thing, uh, talked about this idea of attack trees. And it's a quite a simple method. There are others out there, but it gives you an idea about how you can start thinking about prevention in a more rational sense. So he starts off with some goal that you're trying to achieve. In this situation, we are going to try and open a safe. So then you start enumerating the different ways in which a malicious party could open your safe. Well, they could pick the lock. Okay, uh, how, what else could they do? Well, they could learn the combination. So, uh, or they could cut it open. How would they learn the combination? Well, to learn the combination, they could find it written down, uh, or they could get the combination from the target. It all gets a bit noirish now. Uh, how would I get the combination from the target? Well, I could blackmail them, I could threaten them, and I could bribe them. Suddenly, infosec seems like a really interesting pastime, right? You get to worry about people being blackmailed and threatened. Um, I, I worked at a, uh, a, a rather large bank in the UK, um, and your login name was a nine-digit number. There's nothing to make you feel at home like having your login name as a nine-digit number. How many nine-digit numbers can you remember in your life? Not many. These were so long that people would write them down on a post-it note, and they would also write down their passwords because the password policy was so complicated. And obviously, you might as well put them both together. And this high street, this was not a high, this was an investment bank. Uh, you could actually walk on the streets around uh, East Cheap, look through the windows, and see people's uh, post-it notes with both the username and password on there. So, you know, before you worry about premise security and bioinformatics uh, accessing premises, maybe stopping people from writing things down is good. So once you've enumerated your different attack vectors, you can then start applying weights. How, how hard would it be for an attacker to use one of these axes? And maybe you decide that actually picking the lock is impossible because we've, we've got the best lock you can. But actually, um, finding it written down is probably quite easy. So how do we avoid people writing it down in a place that can be found? So this is useful. You start thinking about the different attack vectors that people can have. You start thinking then about how easy it is for somebody to exploit them, and then you start looking at what you can do to cheaply increase the cost of that attack vector such that no malicious attacker could use it. So let's think about an example microservice system. Uh, those of you who read my book know I often use this domain, this fake domain of the music web shop. Um, and so here we are. We have a bunch of services in a perimeter. This is what the box is. We start looking at this and start thinking about, well, how could people gain access to our stuff? What, what are the opportunities? Well, straight away, we start thinking about more well, transport security. That thing I mentioned earlier, we've taken what used to be in-method calls and now network calls. Those things are potentially much more vulnerable to people. So what can we do about protecting our transport security? Well, we should probably start with the basics, right? We all now operate in a world of HTTPS everywhere. Hands up is if, if in your corporate network, all of your in-corporate network goes over HTTPS. There's like 10 people, right? 
It's a nice idea. We don't tend to do it, though, do we? Right? This, is, this is the low-hanging fruit, people. Right? This really is the low-hanging fruit. We should probably talk about why HCBS can be useful, because it's not a panacea. Uh, what does it give us? It gives us server guarantees. This can be useful. It tells us that the thing we're talking to is really the thing we think we're talking to. That can be useful. A really smart attacker might stand up a service that looks like your service, because the APIs are very simple. I could write something, and I just intercept all your traffic. right? So now we at least know, when I make a call, that I'm actually talking to the person I think I'm talking to. We know that the payload hasn't been manipulated. You know, we've not had a man-in-the-middle attack, hopefully. But we have no client guarantees. So I get an inbound call. I don't necessarily know who it is that's talking to me unless I've applied some other auth scheme on top of that. And the certificate management at the server points can be quite painful. You know, the, the process of issuing certificates, renewing them, especially in a world where you're doing automatic deployment of services, can be painful. Now, some of the certificate management stuff is a lot easier to deal with now. How many people here have heard of Let's Encrypt? Excellent. This is fantastic. Like, a year and a half ago, I probably had about 10 people, and now two-thirds of this room probably know about Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt, just to be clear, are a uh, free automated uh, certificate authority. Um, people fixated straight away on the word free. These people will issue you a, a HTTPS certificate for free, and a good one at that. And people thought, free is great. That's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is the word automated. Because they've also provided in, in sort of this now, this ACME protocol, a, a tool chain for automatically creating, issuing, and applying and renewing certificates, drastically lowering the barrier to entry to automatically issuing and renewing certificates as part of a normal automated deployment process. So it's a very, very standard, very easy way to get going. So I would encourage you, take a look at Let's Encrypt if you're looking at reducing the, the barrier to entry. If you're on Amazon, Amazon has similar support with its own certificate management stuff now. Those excuses around complex uh, automation around these stuff is kind of falling away. OK, so HTTPS, that's good. It gets us so far. Maybe, maybe we just decide to, oh, we've gone backwards. Um, maybe we just decide to adopt HTTPS within our network as a default position. We can, once we've automated it once, it's done for everybody. Let's move forward. OK, what next? Well, what if, if actually we need a higher level of, 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 of sort of uh, certainty about, say, client guarantees? Like when actually a client calls us, we wouldn't know who that client is. Well, then we can start thinking about things like client-side certificates. So now, you know, a client has some sort of certificate. They use that to sign the request they send. The server is able to say, yes, the person who did that really does have that certificate. Therefore, I have some level of certainty as to who they are. This is a lot better. We now have client and server guarantees. We know that somebody isn't pretending to be us. Problems, of course. Client-side certificates, if you thought the server-side certificates for HTTPS were painful, oh my god. Are these things more painful? Um, I have met people that have spent months, if not years, trying to automate PKI infrastructure using Chef and Puppet and stuff like that. Many of them have gone insane. Um, more recently, Netflix did open source their Lima framework, which is a pluggable framework for doing automated uh, provisioning of uh, PKI infrastructure. The reason automation is so important in the context of microservices is because you do not have one thing anymore. You have multiple things. And when you have lots of things, you don't want to have a sort of linear scaling of manual work. You need to automate to get rid of that. Automation becomes incredibly important in a microservice uh, environment to the point where I would actively not use any technology that could not be automated. So Lima is sort of still fairly new. I haven't heard of many people expanding it beyond the initial footprint of what Netflix use it for. Um, but that's potentially showing us what the future could be for this stuff. And maybe for things like that, I might use require uh, client-side certificates for, say, trusted external parties. In this particular example, I'm sending royalty payment data to an external third party. I really want to make sure that I'm not sending it to the wrong person. And so an additional level of guarantees might be required there. Um, I did sort of mention the word auth there. You know, there's client-side and server-side guarantees, and that just says, yes, this program I'm talking to really is the program I think I'm talking to. It doesn't really do anything beyond that. It doesn't actually say that program is really allowed to do what it says it wants to do. So this difference of authentication and authorization. Unfortunately, Aaron was going to be doing a talk about that today, and he hasn't been able to come. Um, but we have this other level of authorization problem. 
Oh, yes, the customer service, that is the customer service talking to inventory service, and they're asking for some stuff. Should they be asking for what they're actually asking for? Again, we can think of the simple stuff. When we're thinking about our perimeter, we can think of things like OAuth. So I have some mobile token that I use to authenticate with my application. I might use some base, form-based authentication. And so there I am, I arrive at the music web shop, and I know, yes, Sam is logged in, and that really is Sam, and he's allowed to see Sam's information, and that's great. And then the music web shop decides to go and make a call downstream to fetch information from the user service. And so I've authenticated myself with the music web shop. The music web shop says, yes, you're good to go. And then it's made a call downstream to another service. What a lot of people do in this situation is they assume implicit trust. The user service in this world says, well, I'm just going to assume that any calls that have come to me from the music web shop have actually been verified that those calls are allowed to be made. You're putting a lot of reliance on your upstream party. What you're opening yourselves up to here is, is something called the confused deputy problem. It's actually a quite complex problem in security engineering. It's a situation where you can trick an intermediate, an intermediary into asking for information you shouldn't be able to ask for. So a simple example, I log in as Sam, I then ask the music web shop for information for Praveena, and the music web shop doesn't revalidate that I'm allowed to do that. It makes a call downstream and pulls back Praveen's data. Now, that is quite a tricky problem to solve. Uh, historically, people have tried to solve this using things like nested SAML assertions. They have also gone insane. So don't do that. Uh, increasingly, what we're seeing the use of are things like um, JWT, uh, JavaScript Web Tokens. That's a way that when you do the initial authorization, you get a token back that represents your credentials. For downstream calls, so when the music web shop makes a call on your behalf to say a downstream user service, it passes your credentials downstream. The downstream service can validate that not only are they a valid set of credentials, but can also interrogate those for what things you're allowed to do. So effectively passing those credentials on through your chain. That becomes more challenging when you're using, say, asynchronous driven services, potentially. You're going to have to find some way of passing those claims through. But the system we're using at the moment, we're using JWT for this purpose. We also have to think, of course, about data at rest. Here again, we get some nice benefits of microservices because data at rest is a sort of a complex problem. Or when we have a large monolithic database, uh, if you, you often don't just decide to encrypt the whole thing because that often has performance implications. And so I've seen systems where certain tables and databases were encrypted and the rest were not. This then becomes interesting because I've seen situations where although a table's data was encrypted, you could actually get information leakage from the foreign key relationships between those tables and other tables. Uh, and so you can often make mistakes that way. Uh, you always have the problem, of course, with encryption of databases, which is where do you put the keys. Um, but of course, with the microservice system, if you're, pra if you're following the approaches that I recommend of keeping you know, your data inside your service and not sharing databases, you could at least just say, you know what? The only data at rest that we really are super care careful about is actually the stuff that our users service has. So what we're going to do is we're just going to encrypt that whole database. And the rest of the other systems we'll just leave alone. We'll keep them simpler. So again, we get to use microservices for us. Um, little aside when talking about prevention, we should probably just mention Docker because microservices and Docker do go together. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, this old paper now from a while ago, but um, uh, Banyan Ops did some research on Docker Hub and found that 30% of all the Docker Hub images contain critical vulnerabilities. Uh, these weren't situations where people were maliciously going and poisoning Docker Hub. People just created images on Docker Hub and then didn't update them. They didn't patch things. And there are loads of organizations that are taking images from Docker Hub and then deploying their software on them. And they're not checking to see if these things need to be updated. Um, I, I would suggest that uh, running stuff for the Docker Hub on your public, on your production systems is sort of akin to finding a USB drive in the, in the gutter, plugging it into your production systems and copying it over and thinking, yeah, that'll be right. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend using stuff for the Docker Hub. Um, uh, the tooling and the trust models around this are improving, but until then, I always write my uh, Docker recipes from scratch for prod systems. We are around prevention starting to get better about a tooling that we can build into our pipelines, these prevention mechanisms. Uh, a lot of tools like Find Bugs and Checkstar will do some level of looking at secure coding practices. Um, you've got similar tools for Ruby and Python out there that can look at code and say, you're doing something that may not be sensible here. 
Um, and those are starting to happen more. Uh, automation in the, in the security space is still lacking somewhat. A lot of the traditional tools in security space don't really lend themselves to automation. Starting to change, I think. I think we're seeing the same thing. We're testing. You know, Mercury used to be the testing tool. And then when developers decided that they need to start doing testing, they looked at Mercury and thought, oh my god, this thing is horrendous. You can't automate it. It's very expensive. And Selenium was created. Selenium was called Selenium because it's the antidote to mercury poisoning, believe it or not. I think it's starting to happen now with security tools, but they will suffer from some, some frustration in this area. Um, and of course, I do want to say when we talk about prevention, we should talk about the basics. How many people here pr patch their production servers once a week? Once a week? How many of you patch your production servers once a month? How many of you don't know how often you patch your production systems? Yeah, more people, right? Uh, this by far will be your biggest attack surface area for most of you, I would imagine. A large amount of the indiscriminate um, attacks out there, a lot of those things I was showing you earlier from that Norse map, those things just flying around, are just you know, en masse exploits looking for unpatched systems. And often just one unpatched system on your network can be a way into the rest of your, your, your estate. Um, there are tools out there like Tripwire and UpGuard and Spacewalk and things that will look at your, your premises and look at the patch level of things. Um, the Key.io guys are doing some great stuff around Docker, actually looking at patch levels of machines. So this stuff's getting better, but just basic stuff here, please, people. Patch your stuff. Right, let's move on. Let's talk to about detection. We've done our best to stop a bad thing from happening, but sometimes a bad thing does happen, and then how do we know it even happened in the first place? Uh, first things first, uh, keep an eye on when you do need to apply patches. Look for your CVEs, subscribe to service like Qualys, uh, know when there's a new CV on your Java stack that needs to be updated. This isn't just good because you know you need to apply a patch, but you know that an exploit happened. Some of you may remember Shellshock. Uh, this was a, an exploit that was in Bash that was there for a, a number of years. The interesting thing, I was talking to one of the internal ops people at ThoughtWorks, and, and, and he was saying, well, the thing is, we know we were vulnerable for a good two-year period because everyone was vulnerable to Shellshock for a good couple of years. What we don't necessarily know is whether or not we were exploited, but when you were exploited by Shellshock, there were traces that you could look through in your systems. And actually what we did was we found we actually had our logs aggregated and into one location so we could go and look and see if we saw any traces of Shellshock actually being used. And actually logging is one of the best things that you can do in terms of making it easy to detect if, if problems have occurred, if you've had attacks. Aggregate all of your logs, pull them off of the machine, stick them in one central location. You may also want to think about retention policies and how long you keep things for. A lot of teams I've worked with only want to keep their logs for, say, a month or so because they get too big. If you actually want to understand if you were affected by an exploit two years ago, you may need longer log, uh, log times. So yes, by all means, run something like the Elk stack on your own premises. Run something like um, Sumo Logic or Paper Trail. Or, of course, the, the new uh, Humio. You should go talk to the guys around the corner. This is stuff that's useful for anybody in the microservice system. It becomes a really essential tool in detecting um, security issues in your systems. Other things can help. Uh, some of the application firewalls out there, like Mod Security, can also pick up attacks on your system. Um, and so running these sorts of things as perimeter security detection mechanisms are very useful. I've used Snort in the past, which is an intrusion detection system. Uh, and some of those systems will stop, obviously, bad behavior, and they'll warn you about potentially concerning behavior. So those are good things to use. In the context of microservices, though, we do have some interesting questions to ask. A lot of people talk about microservices as being an architectural style that gives you options. And people like options. I get to do lots of things now. I get to use lots of languages. Polyglot is the future. I'm kind of not so sure for a number of reasons. But in security space, I'm especially interested. If I have, say, five different technology stacks in use, that's five different stacks that I've got to keep up to date with, with the latest versions of patches, not only for the core runtimes and the core libraries, but any community libraries that I've now got to patch. I've got to be really, really on the ball about keeping that stuff up to date and understanding how to write software on those technology stacks in a way which is secure. This is, our, you know, I'm, I'm adding a lot more work. So there was a, there's a question here. It's about whether or not polyglot microservices systems 
will be less secure than their sort of systems that maybe have one or two technology stacks. The flip side to that is if you got really good at managing your polyglot environment, you might have a different sort of property, which is now you've got more things that have to be broken. A malicious attacker will not just have to now find an exploit that works against your Java stack, but also maybe against your Ruby stack or your Go stack. That is a puzzle for me, and I'm not quite sure what the answer is. I do, though, see a general pattern with microservice um, organizations that uh, they start off with a high degree of polyglottism. And over time, that normally subsides, especially for teams that are over about 50 people. You know, if organizations have more than, say, 50 developers or so. SoundCloud saw that pattern. They start off with a large number of languages. And over time, they're mostly now a Scala and Clojure shop, mostly because they want to reduce the sort of overhead for people having to re-implement um, libraries and common code across different technology stacks. Let's talk about response. So we've found out something bad's happened, and now we need to go and let people know and do something about it. Um, the great thing about response is there's a great number of examples of how response is done very badly. How many people here have heard of Target in the US? Right. Target, big retailer, for people who don't know it. They were hit with a particularly nasty exploit. Uh, this was a piece of malware that was loaded onto the tills. And when you swiped your credit card, it would capture, it was a memory resident bit of malware, so it captured the credit card information as the transaction was taken. This malware then sat, it collected loads of of credit cards, and then it exfiltrated that back out of the network. And something like 40% of all US credit card holders were affected by this. That's a big deal. This is kind of an interesting example in terms of terrible response for a number of reasons. Unlike many of the large retailers in the US, Target did actually have a dedicated in-house InfoSec team. That team was running software that detected that this malware was installed, and when that malware was installed, they alerted people. That software detected when that, mal that, when that malware then took those credit cards and took them out of the network, and they raised the alerts. The problem was, Inside that organization, those alerts were completely and utterly ignored. It gets worse. It actually ended up, I believe, being a congressperson who actually made Target make this public. Because Target found out this had happened and didn't tell the public. Most countries around the world do not have mandatory data breach reporting laws. So Target had to keep were trying to keep this quiet. So you had a mass data breach of a large number of credit cards and one of the biggest names in retailing in the US kept quiet about it. The CEO eventually lost his job over this. Um, Home Depot also got hit by exactly the same breach fairly recently. Uh, this was actually quite good for the software FireEye, because the FireEye software did actually detect this malware was being used. Unfortunately, what happened was the InfoSec team wasn't properly wired into the reporting structures of the organization, and so there, observations were completely and utterly ignored. This is an organization that had put a lot of effort into prevention and detection, and no effort into thinking about what happens when we do detect something. It's a great example of how not to respond. Uh, I, I really can encourage you to go and read uh, Brian Krebs, uh, his blog, his, fa his fantastic Krebs on security. He talks actually about the whole story about how this thing unfolded. And there's a lot of examples of how not to do things on that blog. Comms actually really is at the heart of this. When something bad happens, you need to know what to do. Have you even thought about who you're going to tell? Who is going to have the conversation? Who's going to tell publicly your customers? Is that going to be a CSO? Do you have a CSO? Is it your CTO? Is it your CEO? Who's going to write that? What are you going to say when something bad happens? How quickly are you going to get a bit of conversation out? Comms are essential. Ultimately, comms, there are some great examples of comms being done very badly. How many of you heard of, actually, a lot of people pretend not to know about it. A few of you have, yeah. OK, a Canadian site, hookup site for people who are in relationships. And um, so what happened was a hacking group came out and said, we've got all your data. And uh, Ashley Madsen said, no, you don't. You don't have our data. And they say, you do, we, we do, we've definitely got your data. And they say, okay, you might have a bit of our data. 
And they say, no, no, we've got all of your data. I say, you, you haven't got all of our data. Okay, you have got all of our data. Okay, but that's all you've got. But it's all encrypted, you can't read it. All right, you can read it. Uh, okay, but that's definitely all you've got. You've just got all of our data and you can read it. Uh, oh, you've also got all of our emails as well. Uh, oh, you've also got all of our source code as well. Oh, isn't that bad? Um, and what happened was a blanket number of denials were coming out. No, this data isn't real. No, they don't have this information. No, it's not the full records. No, we don't know that. You know, and it went on and on, and these denials came out, and these denials came out, and they stretched the story out by handling those comms badly for weeks and weeks and weeks. There was always going to be a lot of visibility in this particular case because of how salacious this particular story is. But the, this is a, it's a classic example of how not to do comms around a data breach. It was trivially easy for Ashley Madsen to have got hold of this data breach because it was circling on paste bin, and it would have taken a small matter of time to look at that and know whether or not this data was accurate or not. A great counterexample would have been that of Tylenol. So Tylenol in the um, US, um, uh, Johnson & Johnson is the parent company. Tylenol is the biggest uh, pain medi uh, medication on the market, at least it was. Now, there's a really sad uh, and tragic story um, many years ago where bottles of Tylenol were being poisoned and many people in Chicago died. And no one kind of knew how this was getting into the system. They didn't quite know if people were doing it at the manufacturing plant, if people were going into the stores and tampering with it. Uh, but Johnson & Johnson decided, right, straight away, we're just recalling Tylenol from across the whole of the US. We're pulling it all back, pulling it out of every single store. So the number one brand leader in pay medication, we're pulling it from all the stores. We're going to redesign the packaging, we're going to redesign the capsule to make them tamper resistant. Uh, the recall cost them over like $100 million uh, or so. The PR bump from this was huge for them. They did the right thing, and the public rewarded them. They suffered no loss of market share. If in anything, their brand increased, because they went out and they did the right thing. This is an organization that had their shit together. They knew what to do when a problem occurred. Here's the kind of interesting thing. When you find out your system has been hacked, you are not necessarily going to be thinking rationally. You are not going to come up in that moment with a coherent comms plan. That's why what you should do is, when things are calm, have a conversation. What should we say? Who's it going to come from? Let's draft something now and stick it in Evernote. Because when the oh shit moment comes, you remember, oh, we talked about this. Uh, Graham's going to send it out. We'll copy and paste it in, and we'll update it, and we'll send that out. That's far more likely to be useful to you than you trying to come up with a comms plan in the heart of a disaster like this going on. You can also send bad messages to people inside your own organization. Uh, I got into a small amount of trouble around this particular story. Um, so in, the U U in Australia where I live, Telstra is the big telco. They operate across the whole of Australia. They were sort of the, previously the state-owned uh, monopoly. They had a failure that took out um, uh, cell and just and wired access for most of Australia. And they came out very, very quickly, which was good. And they came out very, very quickly, and they basically said, uh, it, was, it was some guy's fault. This statement I love is, is uh, the employee responsible didn't follow procedures, and clearly that's not a good thing. But I wouldn't want to preempt the proper investigation. It sounds like you've already done your investigation, and you've decided that guy's to blame. Uh, we'll figure out what the right thing is to do once we've had a chance to dig into detail. So this is a great example of straight away, yeah, the thing to do is to blame an individual. I mean, this is just boneheaded comms. You get out quick, great. You say we don't know what the cause is, great. We blame one person. Now, what do you think at this point? You're the telco of, one of, the, world, uh, you know, of the, the biggest telco in one of the world's largest um, economies. And you have a system where one person can make a single mistake and take out the whole network for everybody. So step one, sounds like your network is shit. Now think what happens if you're a Telstra employee. And there are a lot of Telstra employees out there. How do you feel? My COO goes out and bags out some guy. And you know that everybody in Telstra knows who that person is now, don't you? Um, I got in a little bit of trouble because I blogged about this and said that if I was working at Telstra, I'd look for another job and then found out that there was still a client at Thoughtworks, which wasn't great for me for a moment. But anyway, um, the COO no longer has a job. I don't know if these things are related, but 
Telstra continued to have a succession of failures after this, and the comms got a bit better about it afterwards. Um, it's, it's pretty worth reflecting on this blame culture stuff around this sort of response. The, the problem I look at this, beyond the fact that you immediately went and tried to blame an individual, is it's the nonsense of having a telco who is completely dependent on one person never making a mistake in this context. Sidney Decker talks a lot about systems being to blame. When you have a failure, the system allowed that failure to happen. You created a situation in which an individual making a mistake, and we are all human, we have all made mistakes, but you had a system in which an individual making a mistake allowed that failure to occur. I can thoroughly recommend his uh, keynote um, uh, from DevOps Days Down Under many years ago. Uh, John Allsborough says that, you know, finding the root cause of failure is like finding the root cause of a success. When something bad does happen, when you do have a breach, it's never going to be one thing. You are going to have to look a bit more widely at the system that you had in place that allowed those things to happen. So you need to think a little bit beyond just blaming one person. Uh, there was a silver lining to the Telstra story, by the way. So one of the things they did to try and recover trust is they gave everyone a free day today. On a Sunday, not a work day, they're not stupid. That would have been too useful. So they did it on a Sunday when their data usage was lowest, and one guy managed to do a terabyte of downloads on a, on a 4G mobile dongle, which I felt like, you know, okay, cool, at least someone got something out of this whole story. So just do a little bit of prep. It's not a lot. Have a chat. Have a conversation. Think, what's going to happen? Who's going to say something? What are we going to say? So let's talk now about recovery. So we tried stopping the bad thing from happening. We didn't stop all of it. We now spotted the problem and we handled it properly, what do we do next? Well, recovering from situations, the first thing to say is, do you have backups? This, again, can get more complicated in the microservices world. Now we've potentially scattered our data into multiple different databases, potentially running on different machines. A lot of the issue is if you've had a malicious, persistent attacker on your network for a period of time, you may need to roll back state of your data a long way, especially if you've been hit by a crypto locker, where your data's been captured and encrypted, and somebody else now has the keys. Backups become essential. Those backups need to be off-site, not on your premises. Some of you may know the story of a startup a couple of years ago where a, um, the Amazon credentials were leaked and the whole production system was wiped out. That's OK. We'll recover from our backups. Oh, our backups were in the same account. Oh, it's OK, we can rebuild the system okay. oh, elsewhere. The source code was stored on the same account. The whole startup was wiped out in the matter of minutes just by someone getting its credentials. Your backups need to be off-site somewhere, and they also need to work. Um, because you're recovering, often, the, uh, what you'll often want to do is just scorch the earth. You want to burn the whole thing down, rebuild those systems from scratch, reconstitute your data from scratch, knowing that you've expunged any uh, malicious party. Burning it all down implies that you can build it back up again. That implies automation. Again, in a microservices environment, you probably do have a high degree of automation. But this is something you should practice. Organizations that use immutable servers, that actually rebuild their servers as part of every single deployment, are often in a really good place here. Because every time they push, and maybe they push two or three times a week, they tear the service down and rebuild it, this is just a no-brainer for them. They know how to do this. On the other hand, if what you've been doing is incrementally applying patches and service releases onto, a, onto the same machine for multiple years, this is going to be quite a scary idea to you. And there is a question. Again, with microservices, we have more of these things. If this is a manual process, the process of rebuilding your infrastructure, if the process of reconstituting a backup is a manual process, and now you've got 30 of these things where you used to have one, you've just made a rod for your own back. Um, other things. When it comes to response, many people are quite good at doing post-mortems. They'll write down what happened and when, and they'll come up with an action plan. Very few organizations I work with, they actually go back and look at them and say, did we follow that? Did we do what we said we were going to do? It's depressing when you read some of those post-mortems and realize, oh, yeah, we said we'd fix that last time, and we didn't, and the same thing happened again. Go back, look at what happened. Do it every six months or so. It's been six months since this issue happened. 
have we really done the things we said we were going to do? Because what's going to happen is, at the moment after the panic, you'll come up with your action plan, you'll go to your C-level execs and say, look, we've got to delay some new features, or we've got to go slow, we need to implement these security preventions. And they say, yep, great, that's fine, because the most important thing right now. And days pass and weeks pass, and then the pressure comes back for you to get back to doing what you were supposed to be doing before your old features get done, and that work you were going to do gets pushed to one side, and six months down the line, it all happens all over again. Um, so do look at your old post-mortems. So, what I was hoping to do today was to sort of give you a bit of introduction almost to what application security is. It isn't just this one faceted approach to stopping the bad man from coming into my network. Uh, even within the context of prevention, it's much more nuanced than that. So think about models like attack trees that allow you to think rationally about the different ways a malicious party can gain access to my system. And, and actually make sure you spend effort in the right places. And maybe the majority of your effort in application security does go into prevention. Maybe it does. But it shouldn't only go there. You need to know if a bad thing happens. You need to know when you failed to prevent something. A basic amount of thinking, a conversation with your, your higher-ups about how you're then going to respond is going to be essential to avoid making bad calls in the public eye when everybody's running around in the panic. You almost need to accept that this stuff is going to happen. And you do your best to limit the damage of this and get better at building systems that are resilient to these forms of attacks. I hope I've just given you a few ideas about how every one of you can be part of making your systems better. We don't have to just offload this to specialists and say, it's not our job. We may not all be doctors, medical doctors in this room, but we all know the importance of washing our hands. And we are increasingly in a world in which it's not acceptable anymore for us to abdicate responsibility for application security and assume that somebody else is going to do it for us. Um, I did mention I do have a book. It's being translated. The, uh, the English translation is available outside. I've also got a, um, a blog post, uh, sorry, a, a uh, podcast at magpietalkshow.com. I interview interesting people. Uh, I just had a couple of NASA scientists on who might be interested. I interviewed Bridget the other day, so she'll be up in a few weeks. Um, but uh, without further ado, I think we've probably got time for questions. So if you should be asking questions via the app, please do remember to rate the session. I'm just going to take a look now. At, at the app and see if anyone's asked me any questions. Not found. Yeah. OK. That's not good. See, at this point, the track host would leap into action and would fix this problem for me. Oh, it signed me out. The irony of me talking about you know, security and authorization when the conference app logs me out and doesn't let me see the questions that I've been asked. Go to the track host page. This is all very exciting. Oh, I've seen how votes already. Excellent, thank you. Um, come on. Uh, so, okay, so we have a few questions, so in no particular order. Um, uh, it's one thing to view the logs and another to actually understand what one is viewing. Uh, how do we counterfeit this, given the million exploits out there, counteract this maybe? The million exploits out there. I think it's a very valid point. Uh, you know, you, you, we often, I've seen a lot of logs that don't necessarily make sense to me, and that's just true. But the first thing is to say is if you don't store the logs, you've no got any chance of ever reading what's in them. So I would store first, understand later in general around this stuff. Um, I, I actually, uh, the current startup I'm operating at, I actually do go through the logs. And purposely, I go into parts of the code base I don't understand, and I look in the logs and go, what's going on here? Um, when you first start aggregating all those logs together, it's going to look like an unholy fire hose of noise and mess. Um, but you won't see that until you get it into one place. So you've just got to start that process. Um, it does become a fun piece of archaeology. It's like detective work. Now, it's often, you know, some people say, you know, there was a great tweet recently that, you know, it says, uh, I've turned my system into a microservice system so that every um, production outage becomes a murder mystery. Uh, it is that kind of thing, right? You're trying to trace down where the hell things stopped happening. Logs are often the best places to go. Um, okay, next question. Uh, your opinion of Yahoo after two years of silence about the world's largest data breach? Technically, 
I think Expedia, no, Experian in the US was the world's largest data breach in terms of number of records. But yes, it's a big one. It's not a good one either, right? Uh, my opinion of them, it's not high. It's not really not high. Um, here's the deal, right? Countries don't have mandatory data reporting laws, uh, data, data breach reporting laws. The US doesn't. I mean, Germany, which is the most savvy country around data in Europe, for example, doesn't. Australia doesn't. The UK doesn't. Um, and so the only sort of incentive for a company to come out and be open about this is often the penalties that they face from the, you know, your data protection officers. Um, and often the fines that they can be levied against these organizations are quite small. And so really the biggest disincentive for this information getting out there is, is like losing public trust. And at the moment, the penalties for this stuff is not, are not high enough. I think as our customers become more savvy about the implications of these breaches, I think we'll, get, we'll hold companies to account more. I actually personally think that the law has a part to play. I think organizations should have to tell you if they have a reasonable, ex a reasonable belief that your information has been compromised by a malicious party. And I, I think the fact that people argue against that is a bit nonsensical to me. Um, uh, okay. I, I, did, I think that the timing of it was quite good as well with the takeover. It did make me chuckle. Uh, uh, you propose using HTTPS between service requests. How would you reason when using other protocols for communication? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fair point. So a lot of people will use alternative, say, uh, synchronous RPC mechanisms um, uh, over just sort of raw TCP rather than HTTPS. Um, some of those protocols actually have built-in ways of encrypting those payloads. Um, so it'd be worth looking into that. Um, uh, Google's uh, RPC2 uh, technology actually just uses HTTP2 under the hood, which is binary, and so you can just use HTTPS. In fact, it's by default, it's HTTPS everywhere. Uh, I've done stuff with encrypting payloads on, on other sorts of transport. But yeah, the more you drift away into other more bespoke transport mechanisms, you're almost going to have to look at what they provide out of the box in terms of protecting them. Um, there's not like a load of easy answers there. Um, OK, let me see if there's any other questions, if you still log me in. Uh, so, can you explain how asynchronous services do authorization using JWT access tokens? Well, you can't. You just need to find a place to pass that token around in the payload. Uh, it's the same as sort of effectively. You don't have the obvious headers to pass that stuff through with. So you're going to need to find a space in your pro payload to pass that JWT web token around. And then, as long as the downstream service has the ability to reinterrogate that and revalidate that token, you should be fine. Um, okay. And I think that's. Oh, we have time for it. We're a bit over. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm available on Twitter uh, at Sam Newman. Uh, if you want to keep sending me questions, I'll try and answer stuff over the Twitters. I hope this has been useful, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>